Welcome, friends. Pour your favorite cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa, and settle in for a sip from the sip from the Utica Institute Museum. Sips from the Sip is all about sharing the history of little-known people and places in Mississippi. We're serving up truth, justice, with a dollop of sass. I'm your host, Jean Green. Today's episode is the 24th of a multi-part series of readings and discussions from the book, Black Man's Burden. Joining me today to discuss Chapter 12 is Dr. Linda Laws. Dr. Laws is a longtime educator and administrator in the Hines County School System. Thank you for joining us today on this episode of Sips from the Sip. I'm happy to introduce to you Dr. Linda Laws. Dr. Laws is a good friend of the Utica Institute Museum, and she is the noted alumni of Heinz AHS and Utica Junior College. She's a longtime educator and administrator in the Heinz County School System. She is currently very active in all aspects of her community of Utica and in Heinz County. I am so pleased that she agreed to discuss the chapter in this book with me. Welcome, Dr. Laws. Thank you. Dr. Laws, we're going to talk about William Holtzclaw and chapter 12 in his book, Black Man's Burden. I know you have some thoughts on what that chapter is about. So if you'd like to start out and share a little bit of your thoughts on what Holtzclaw is going on with him here. Educating. Okay. That was the first thing I noticed as I started the chapter and then going into the testimonials. It was interesting to read the interactions between those participants. And in reading that, education was mentioned several times, but the major part of the conference that I could tell was education, Mm -hmm. where those farmers that came They were educated by the speakers, Mm -hmm. but they were also educated by the persons telling their stories. That's true, yeah. And it was interesting that we know that you have to work to get ahead. And so when those stories were being told, it was interesting that some of them seemed very hard, Mm -hmm. hard in the sense that they didn't see down the road. They didn't see that light at the end of the tunnel. And so to hear them talk about how they acquired land Mm -hmm. was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I started to think, well, there were a few families that I knew living not far from here that owned property. Okay. We were not one of them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we weren't. My parents sharecropped. Okay. Right down the road, less than three miles. From here? Yes. Okay. I'm on 18. Okay. And so to hear that there were farmers that owned land, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time because Hmm. we didn't see those people. We only saw sharecroppers. Right. But if we had been in contact with some of the farmers further up this way, Mm -hmm. past the college, we probably would have experienced some of that Mm -hmm. because I know there are many There were many, as we moved to Utica, we realized there were many farmers that had property, Mm -hmm. acres and acres of property between Mm -hmm. the college and the town. Okay. But we were farther down. Were y'all close to Carpenter? Yes. Oh, okay. Close to Carpenter. And that was pretty much all sharecropping, Mm -hmm. quite a few families. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting. And then I thought about generational wealth. Right. So if we had, and I don't know where all of these farmers came from. Right. It really isn't mentioned. So uh, that would be interesting if you Mm -hmm. wanted to do a little research to find where did they come from? Where did they live? Mm -hmm. And if many of them live, and I think they did, in this area, the vicinity of the the college, college, what happened to the generational wealth? What happened to that land? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What happened to that land? 
we know the Williams on Chapman Road. Mm-hmm. And Miss Cini Williams, Miss Cini, was it Williams? Miss Cini lived up 18. Okay. Miss Miss Bland, the McKinleys, mm-hmm. up 18, before you get to you, the town. Okay. They had property, and we, we heard about the property because we heard about it when it was being sold. Oh, okay. So that would be interesting to find out where those farmers were, where they came from. When you mentioned, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Dr. Laws, but (laughs) you mentioned generational wealth and what happened to the land. So as with many families, the children didn't carry on in the tradition of their parents or their grandparents. And so is this what would have happened? I'm thinking so. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking so. Because as younger folks moved up, like we moved out of Carpenter into Utica. Mm -hmm. And I thought about the house that we moved into. We moved into a small frame house, but it was a new house. Mm -hmm. It didn't have plumbing, indoor plumbing when we moved there. But eventually, Dad put indoor plumbing in. Mm -hmm. And we had what was called a Cadillac of a toilet, outdoor toilet. Oh, okay. (laughs) It had a concrete top. It had a wooden bottom. It was a Cadillac of a toilet. Was it in like a traditional outhouse? Yes, that's what it was. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But but anyway, being so young, I didn't realize how he, they acquired that. Uh And I'm sure with your studies in this area, with Mr. Hostcloth, you have heard the name Shine Davis. Oh, yes. Well, Shine Davis had a piece of property on Marson Road, okay. up near where the dollar store is. Mm-hmm. It used to be called, I believe it was Hillcrest. Okay. A little street was called Hillcrest. And he sold lots of property to mm-hmm. blacks. Huh. And my dad, my sister, they were one of the two. Mm-hmm. And they bought that property and built the house. Mm-hmm. Well, we moved out of Carpenter. Mm-hmm. And then many of those young people in the area moved out of Utica. Okay. So they kept going. They wanted something better, different. Mm -hmm. Because in one piece in here, if you recall, near the end of the book, he was talking about some very hard-to-read things about black Negro women. Yes, that was difficult. That That was difficult to read. But you notice he said the educated Negro woman, Mm -hmm. and I'm not quoting, Mm -hmm. would not, if she took a job as a maid, Mm -hmm. would not endure some of the things that would go on in the homes of the white. You know, thank you for bringing that up because that that was difficult to read. And on, on a couple of levels, one, because... You don't usually think of black women having to endure assaults or whatever when they go, were going into the house to do work. And when Holtzclaw said he had some young women who refused to work in some houses because they were not, and I'm putting this in quotation marks, protected. protected. And that fat black families, black fathers and mothers would not want their daughters going into houses where they would not be protected. It's something that's known but unspoken that this sort of abuse happened. Yes. And that some, the distinction Holtzclaw makes sometimes between the educated and uneducated is sometimes a little difficult in 2024 to kind of come to terms with. But there was a quote unquote, and I'm not quoting him. I'm putting my quote unquote on it. A okay. certain class of woman, yes, that would have encouraged some sort of relationship like that. But an educated woman would not. That's black true. woman. That's true. And did you notice when in going through the chapter, what made it difficult also was that we started after a few pages talking about the conference. Mm-hmm. The Farmers Conference. Then we moved into talking about the grand jury and yeah. what the grand jury was, was looking at. And so I'm, I was kind of wondering, okay, 
why did we have this, this dichotomy is, here? It's yeah. so packed. It's packed with these different writings and Things. I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, and I'm trying to see, okay, now where's the connection? Mm-hmm. But I think the connection goes back to education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we educate young women and men, they will rise above a lot of what they're dealing with now Mm -hmm. during that time. Right. And so each part in that chapter, and that's what he's known for, education. Mm -hmm. The other thing I noticed is that they did not put a town. That was omitted purposely, was it not? I would think so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I said, well, they didn't want to. Put you know. any light on that yeah, what town. was he talking? Was this Utica? Was this Raymond? Was this Vicksburg? What yes, was this? yes. That's what I was like, wow, wow. So th- that was interesting. And then I said, well, you know, when you look at where we are now with book banning, mm-hmm. maybe he saw that coming. Yeah, yeah. That if I include this in this book, this book will not be well received. That's a, that's a good point, Dr. Laws, because I struggled with how Hosclaw wrote this book to possibly gain more funders so he would not possibly have wanted to offend yes. those potential funders. Yes. And if you name names and point fingers, somebody's going to be offended. Yes, yes. So that was showed a lot of savvy on his part. It did. It did. The piece, and I'm jumping all over this That's chapter. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> but the piece where he talks about this property that they were going to purchase. Yes. And the owner reneged. But told him that, even told the lawyer that everything was fine. Yes. Until yes. the day of oh, the sale. Yes. Yes. And and keep in mind, some of his friends Mm -hmm. said you should sue him, Mm -hmm. but he was encouraged by the lawyer and others, not white friends, not to do that. Mm -hmm. That it would be better to leave it alone and look for other properties Mm -hmm. uh, because they were looking at peace. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at, again, I think, Going back to what you said about funding, Mm -hmm. if you sue this person, you might not get funding from somebody else. Yeah. That when they see what you've done. Mm -hmm. And he was, appeared to me to be a person that believed in making connections, Mm -hmm. not joining any one group. That's true. He, He was able to talk to and associate with different groups Mm -hmm. and that's in the beginning of the chapter Mm -hmm. and as you see it it's near the end of the chapter where he's invited to speak to this group what was it called the sociological Mm -hmm. group near the end congress Mm -hmm. he was invited to speak to them after speaking to them he was invited back to speak Mm -hmm. again then he was invited into this group and it was a group to possibly get race relations Mm -hmm. to move into a positive space or area or start that conversation. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was, he was a person that could do that with any type of groups and people, even though we knew a whole lot of ugly stuff was going on. Right. He was able to do that. And that was very interesting to me. It was. It, that one of the things, Dr. Law said, I, and, and I, I've told you this, I struggled with was knowing the reality of what was going on around him yes. in, in the time, what the time was like in this state and the people who were in power in the state and the way he phrased what was going on in the community. I would have, I'd have to stop reading for a second and go, okay, all right. <laughs> Why is he talking like this? Why is he putting it in in this in this light in this tone? Yes, and talking about the the land, Doctor Laws. You know, I think they were trying to get eighteen acres. Yes, it wasn't much. No, uh, 
And then that fell through. And then here we are sitting 121 years later on the 2,000 acres he got. Would he have had that kind of success if he had followed the the advice of his friends to sue the first time? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. He, he was good. Not in this book, but if you, the first book, not what's the other title? Uh, Scholar in Ebony. Yes. Mm-hmm. You remember, remember in that book, it was mentioned that he would not join a particular denomination yes. in the area. Mm-hmm. And there were many. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like they were all pulling at mm-hmm. him to join. But he didn't want to do that mm-hmm. because I understand why. Because yeah. then you're going to be associated with that group. Right. And you might not get what you need from all of the other groups. Right. And so it, it goes back to how he was able to associate with the groups that we're talking about in this chapter 12. Mm-hmm. And he was good at it. He I was. mean, he was. Yeah. If if we even talk about the farmers for a minute and how I got a little amused at the way <laughs> they were, they would tell about their successes. And then the people in the audience would question them. How did you do this? What, what do you mean? You know, you paid that off in five years. How is that possible? So it, it, it was like everyone was held accountable. Yes. You know, you couldn't just say something and folks just took that on face value. They wanted to know exactly how you did it. What made you successful? The one man who talked about how the people in the community would talk to his wife and his daughter. And he was being real frugal, remember? Yes. And his wife and daughter didn't get to dress like the other folks going to church. But when he achieved his level of success, he was real proud to ride past them with his mule or his horse and let them see his success. But it came, he shows that all of that came from a lot of work. But there was there were people in the audience who... There was one, Dr. Laws, do you remember, that was called the unalloyed yes. African. Yes, yes. And I had to, it was it was a word in the ways it is in this book. It was broken up because it could not fit on that page. Mm-hmm. I had to write it down mm-hmm. to see what the word was. Right. And so, you know, talking about the farmers, a lot of what they said, and they were questioned, some of them, by, mm-hmm. by the length of time it took to right. get the property, mm-hmm. the land. I like the way the president, the presiding officer, and also some of the persons in the audience, they saw that it was moving towards some negativity in yes. parts of it where they were being questioned and if you, the only way a certain person can get property, you have to be a mixed race. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and then they would bring it back to focus on the positive part Mm -hmm. of it. And yes, you know, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was not easy. In fact, one of them on page 146, Mm -hmm. and it says, I tell you, if you want anything, you got to work hard mm-hmm. and let people let pleasure let pleasure alone till you get it. Mm-hmm. So going back to the man where the children and the wife had the mouths poked out mm-hmm. because they didn't have the things that others had. Right, and so it was interesting to me that that kept coming up. Yes. They kept saying it, not just what, it may have been Wallace said that, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, Frank Wallace. Mm -hmm. So, but it kept coming up that they wanted to make sure everybody knew it wasn't easy. Right. It takes time. It takes dedication. You have to give up pleasure Mm -hmm. and to make these things happen. So that that, instant gratification kind of pleasure. It comes Mm -hmm. down, it comes later. Do you think, though, a conference like that would work now? I think if it was well-planned and well-administered, that it could work. Because the the lessons that we're taught 
in that chapter about it takes hard work, it takes dedication, it takes time. It's something that needs to be constantly taught. Because the people in, in Holtzclaw's day, some of them wanted instant, instant wealth, instant success. And anything worth having is worth working for. But you have to show people a positive example, like these people in this book, of what it took. Uh, one of the one of the administrators, I think it was the president of it, said that times were different now, that that's why the, some of them were successful. And the man that had been questioned said, and this quote I love, times never got no different. No, I'm sorry. Times don't never get no different with a man that ain't got nothing. It doesn't matter what's going on if you don't have anything. That's true. You just don't have anything and you have to work. So I'm thinking, too, when we talk about relevance of Holtzclaw to today's time, that we need to show that it takes a minute to get from level A to level F for financial security, that you don't walk into any situation having the pinnacle of it. You have to work and pay your dues. And there's so much today of no dues paying. I want it instantly. I want all of the success and I don't want to have to pay for it. But these folks pay for it in sweat. And, you know, some of them went from sharecropping to land ownership. You know, and it, and it's, some failed, and some, some failed. One said he tried twice. Yeah, <laughs> but some failed. They didn't get it the first time. What is it? It's not how many times you fall; it's how many mm-hmm. times you get up. That's right. So yeah, the reason I asked that question is, when reading through this, I thought that you know, in being in Utica, why couldn't we bring people together? in a type of setting where they hear the testimonials, they hear the good, the bad, and the ugly, to encourage others to do better, Mm -hmm. if it's possible, because a lot of what we're reading in this chapter, we're experiencing now. That's right. And I, my pastor said Sunday, but several years ago, months ago, he said, we're not first. What is happening to us now, mm-hmm. it's not, we're not the first ones. It right. has already happened to somebody else. Mm-hmm. We're just next. We're just so next. could this be next? Yeah. Could this be a catalyst? This farmer's conference mm-hmm. be a catalyst to push not just young people, but some of the more middle-aged folks that and folks that are young are not necessarily teenagers mm-hmm. but are willing that might want something better mm-hmm. but don't know how to get it don't know like housing for mm-hmm. instance in the area a conference like this where you go in and you have speakers and you're saying this is how I got a house mm-hmm. I didn't have property it took me six years to pay for the land mm-hmm. paid for the land then it took me Two years to get enough money in the bank. So the bank would lend me money. Right. Because you have to have some money. And Mm -hmm. so it took two years to to save that amount of money. Then we're able Mm -hmm. to start talking about a mortgage. But it won't come in six months. Mm -mm. It's a process. But do we know, do they know that? Do they know it can be done, but you have to be willing to go through what we're talking about with these farmers. Exactly. You have to go through years. It might take 10, uh-huh. might take five, might take two. Mm-hmm. But you got to do it. You got to go through it. Sometimes I think we see our parents or folks our parents' age, let's say. I'm, I'm speaking as if I'm a younger person. Yes. <laughs> we see someone our parents' age or our parent has what looks like an easy go of it. But you didn't see, I have to remind the person in my house, when I was your age, I was working three jobs, one full-time, two part-time. You didn't see that because you were 
a child, all you saw was the result. Yes. You didn't see me juggling, trying to pay which bill this month and which bill next month. So I think in our efforts as parents and as people to protect our young folk from what we experienced, we have shackled them in a way. I I think so. Because they have not seen the struggle. Some of them have, but a lot of them haven't. They see the results of the struggle because they see whatever level of success you have, but they don't know or have not or don't remember what it took to get there. Don't remember the peanut butter sandwiches for supper. Oh, <laughs> or the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So these, these examples in the book, the man saying that he ate cornbread and salt meat. Yes. He didn't and say salt pork. Remember, He didn't say salt pork. That's right. He said salt meat. <laughs> Now, now, I was a little not understanding because we had salt pork when Mm -hmm. I was growing up. Did he mean it wasn't, was he talking about what they called it or was it some other meat that was salted? I think he's talking about (laughs) what they called it, whatever they call that. I, I saw it as, you know, he's got some cornbread and some pot liquor and that's that salt meat and they didn't have a lot of extra vegetables maybe and they didn't have a lot of molasses and and cakes and stuff to go with that. He had what it took to keep him full to keep producing. Yeah. But he didn't have maybe a chicken on the table every every Sunday or something like that. But do you, you remember the days of pinto beans, cornbread, and that was it for supper? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember many of those. See, what I'm and the reason I mentioned that is that I was wondering if he intended, well, first he wanted to make sure you quoted him correctly. Yes. yes. And so that's why I was wondering, okay, Salt meat and salt pork, was it just the phrase they use and he wanted them to quote him directly or did they salt other kinds of meat? And he was saying, you know, he didn't say pork, salt pork. He said salt meat. So were there other kinds of meats that maybe he was eating that well, was salt? You, you know, how do you how do you smoke meat? <laughs> You know that if you have a smokehouse, you don't just smoke the hog. How yeah. do you how do you preserve your beef? How do well, you you know you know what I'm saying? So, if he was getting his little bit of grub out of his little smokehouse he had, he's right. It wasn't necessarily salt pork. Yes, you know. But I was real interested in the way he he. Uh, yes. <laughs> but no, there was no clarity on if it was what what specifically well, that salted. meat was. Because uh-huh. I'm thinking they may have salted some other kinds of, of, of meat. Well, some wild why, game. Yes, even. and mm-hmm. that's why he mentioned the, made the correction. Right. And so that's why I mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we get into, we're going to ease into the problem of miscegenation that <laughs> seemed to really be an issue with them. I think about how in our day and time we talk about immigrants coming and you know they're going to take the jobs and they're going to do the this. And these folks in this time we're talking about the white men having children with the black women and that it was going to create what did it say? It was going to create something that threatened the commonwealth, a mongrel race. Yes. Which will be a menace to our country. Yes. That that is no different than what uh, is being said on whatever news program you listen to about the folks coming in that are disgrace and a, a threat to the the country. They even talk later about a horde, and I was thinking, Lord, a horde of foreign women coming in to do domestic work, a horde of them, and that these foreign women coming from Europe were going to take all the jobs, domestic jobs, because they would be more trustworthy than the black women. But they didn't call them black women. They called them old times after the war, the darkies were trained, but that training has vanished now. So the training of black folks had vanished. And that was the training to be domestics, was Mm -hmm. it not? Yes. 
So they yeah, they mentioned you couldn't find a cook anymore. Right. Uh, that would be satisfactory. And again, not first, mm -hmm. but next, because mm -hmm. this happened way back then. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about ruining the blood or spoiling the blood yes. or contaminating the blood. But well, that's all this is. Yeah. When in this part of that chapter, exactly, it's not. It's back. It's still here. It didn't leave. No. It's still here. That then segues into the the issue with these young women that this also goes back to, and I know I'm skipping Dr. Laws. This oh, goes back to what Booker T. Washington was accused of being a, he acquiesced to what the whites wanted blacks to be. And he trained black folks to be domestics, to be better cooks and better housekeepers and this sort of thing. And that's what W.E.B. Du Bois was opposed to. He wanted folks to go into academics and, and higher education. And there's nothing wrong with either of those. What helps is when you combine those. Yes. And eventually that is what happened. But they talk about what the average salary of a housemaid in the South was between six and $10 a month, a month. And then they're going into situations where they are not protected. protected. So you're working for $6 a month, and then you run the risk of being treated with disrespect. And so Host Call's answer to that was to try to do what to prepare the young women and offer them uh, an out if they uh, got into a situation where they felt threatened? I would think so. And, you know, many times when and what we do as educators, mm -hmm. we want to know if a particular strategy worked. Right. So you go to the source. I present a training. Mm -hmm. and you have an evaluation at the end. Mm -hmm. And you want a person to be honest about That's it. Correct. Not just tell me I'm good, mm -hmm. but you want them to be honest. So you have an evaluation, and you take that evaluation and analyze the results of it to see what you need to change mm -hmm. and what you might need to take out, <laughs> or, you know, you revise mm -hmm. before you present it again. And you remember he asked some of the girls, the young women, mm -hmm. about their experiences. Yes. And he had one that made a comment to let him know that there were some very sexual kinds of things mm -hmm. that were trying to happen when she was in that home. Mm -hmm. And he made a point that that one particular response was the most important one. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, and thinking about Mr. Hoskall, he made some adjustments right. in what he was doing, who they were sending these girls to. Mm -hmm. And that could possibly have been some training that went on. Or some screening. Yes. Of, of those that people. That went on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and like I say, he made a point to mention that one. He put emphasis yes. on that one young woman that had those experiences, why she left that home. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do. Right. You evaluate. That's right. And you see what worked and what didn't work. And, and that's what we're did. doing. That's, that's what we're doing now, yes. right? We're We're looking at... In this, in the context of this campus, what will work? What programming will work here? What do we need to do to have students or potential students show an interest in coming to this location? What are we offering? How are we providing adequate training and protections for them? So in that sense, looking at the example of a hoax claw can inform how we work today. It really can not next. <laughs> but we're not first. That's right. It's happening to us now. We're right. next. So right. I read in this chapter and what I gained from it 
is that many of the things that he mentioned all the way back are happening now. Mm-hmm. Yes. We have, we're having a conference now too, I hear. Yes. We're having a farmer's conference, yes, right? Yes, we are. The Bringing week back of the, the farmer's that's conference. That's right. Okay. When he did, had the, the speaking engagements with this society, sociological society, mm-hmm. and he was asked to speak, he moved into what that grand jury was talking about. Mm-hmm. And he moved to the Negro girls being mm-hmm. in homes where they were not protected. And right. All of these things, if you notice, all of these things are happening now. Yeah. They're happening now. The race ride, he said, what, what in that paper they called that incident about oh, the race the ride. Two young men that were drinking. Yes. Yeah, not yes. drinking, they were they were on some sort of cocaine. Drug. Cocaine, exactly. And I'm wondering where did they get Where did they get back? cocaine back in that day? You know, <laughs> you know how could they afford that? <laughs> that was I was wondering what <laughs> and he mentioned the papers would highlight all that negative. Just like now. Just like now. Mm-hmm. So we're actually just next. We're We're just not first. There's nothing new under the sun. And the pendulum always swings back. I had a professor once talked about the cycle of history was like, when the cycle, it was like a pendulum. Mm -hmm. And it would swing one way until it reached its pinnacle and it would swing back. That's true. And, you know, if if you stay on the upside of the ground, if you stay live long enough, You'll get to see some of that in practice in happening. You will. And what we're looking at now, which makes Holt's Claw and this story so relevant, is there are duplications, as you said, of what went on in this book happening today. The attitudes that were alive and well in 1915 when he wrote this book are just as active today. They may have a different title they may be the the mode of the transmission of the information may be a little more sophisticated than uh, newsprint and telegraph, but it's still put out there and it's still passed on. So we need to counteract that with the positivity and the training that Holtzclaw provided us, the example that Holtzclaw provided, provided for us. Love fest. Love fest. He mentioned on the last page when you said the terms and all, he, he mentioned a love fest when he was meeting with these groups in the last part of the chapter. Uh huh. And I thought about it. I said, now, I didn't know they would have used that used term. Used the term love, <laughs> love fest. fest all the way back there. But he mentioned well, you know, they that's had a good love, it was like a love fest. <laughs> oh, well. You said. Yeah. It's on 158, the very first sentence. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> sort of a love fest. And that was when he was working with that group where he had done those addresses. Mm-hmm. And they had gotten to be so friendly and called it. A, it was like yeah, a love fest. the men turned in to be a sort of a love <laughs> The spirit of goodwill was in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so that Southern Sociological Congress. Yes. Was was what he was talking about. Oh, goodness. Dr. Laws, I, I thank you for joining me today. Is there anything else you want to add before we bring this to a close? Only that because Mr. Hostclaw was here mm-hmm. and we see his works. We've seen his works. Mm-hmm. Some of them are not visible now in the area. I would like to see us duplicate some of the things that he did, like the farmers' conference, mm-hmm. it might not be a farmers' conference, but a type of of gathering where we can bring people together to learn and grow and hear. And when these stories are told, you have something else to give them at the end. Mm-hmm. I bought of 100 acres of land. It took me 10 years, but mm-hmm. this is how to do it. Right, right. You know, where they will come, learn, and grow. Mm-hmm. And to grow this area, that would be major. That's right. So That's I'm going right. to let you do it. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Laws. I appreciate that. And I want to thank you, too, Dr. Laws, for agreeing to join me today for this discussion. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope that our listeners enjoyed it. And we look forward next time to the reading of Chapter 13. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in for Sips from the Sip. Join me next time for a reading of Chapter 13 of William Holt's Clause, Black Man's Burden. This program is supported by donations from our listeners. If you enjoy learning about the history of William Holt's Law, the Utica Institute, and Mississippi, consider donating. To support Sips from the Sip and all the work at the Utica Institute Museum, visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Utica Institute. Until next time, this has been Jean Green coming to you from the heart of the Sip.